Hi, I'm Bob Iaculo. United Water believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Excellence in Education, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, JFK Medical Center, Felician College, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents, Johnson & Johnson, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, and by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. You know, today we celebrate educational excellence with four really terrific New Jersey teachers. Here to discuss what it really takes to be a great teacher, we have Dr. Jeffrey Lee, a biology professor at Essex County College. Rosalind Friday is a third grade teacher at Paul Robeson Elementary School. Mark Martone, we met him in Atlantic City at the NJA convention. He's a 2015 New Jersey Teacher of the Year and a pre-K special education teacher. And finally, Anne McCormick is a chemistry teacher at Jackson Memorial High School, based where? Jackson, New Jersey. I should have known that, right? <laughs> uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us. You are exceptional teachers. That's why you were picked. Um, what does it take, Anne, to be an exceptional teacher? Qualities, go. I think that exceptional teachers desire to be exceptional teachers from the first time they step in the classroom but they're not aiming to be an exceptional teacher. And I think the difference between that is never ever allowing yourself to be satisfied with the job you just did. So every single day when I walk out of the classroom, even 21 years later, I'm thinking to myself, mm, next time, next time I'm gonna get that right. Next time I'm gonna nail that. And it's after years of being told I'm a great teacher and being told I'm an exceptional teacher, I still wonder what it is I'm not doing and who, more importantly, am I not reaching. So I think the exceptional teacher tries every single day to reach every single child in their classroom. That's one of the biggest challenges of teaching. Uh, our subjects are easy. We know our subjects. We know how to address them. We know, I know how to teach chemistry. Content's not as hard. Not as hard. The hardest part is? Uh, the hardest part is looking around a room of 35 learners, understanding that they are different than any other learner that's ever been in my room, and it's important that every one of them learn. And so I need to find how to say the same exact thing mm -hmm. 35 different ways wow. until every light bulb in the room goes on. And then I've done my job. That makes me an exceptional teacher. That's ma what makes teachers years? exceptional. 21 this year. Just as passionate? This, um, I did, yes, I am, actually. And so, in fact, Dr. Lee and I were talking before we came in here, and he asked me why I was retiring in two years. And I said, because I don't want to teach when I'm not just as passionate. Wait, well, why are you retiring? Come on, seriously. Because I'm really old. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> By the way, did you go into teaching first? I did not. You did were not. an accountant? I was, that's right. You admit right. that. I do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do. And uh, when my children were born, I had decided and agreed with my husband that I didn't want to do that anymore. And so I went back to college to get a degree in chemistry. Wow. And only decided at the very end to become a teacher because someone told me I could teach, which yeah. seems bizarre to me, so. Mark, when did you know? I had this great conversation with you in Atlantic uh, City at the convention, the NJA convention. You really struck me at the time as a really passionate teacher. When did you know you wanted to do it? You know, I never wanted to get into teaching. It was when I started, um, uh, a couple of my friends were educators and uh, I, I had no interest in teaching, uh, but I, you know, I needed a job, so I took a job. I thought I was going to be an aide in a kindergarten classroom. It ended up being with a child with Angelman syndrome. Uh, you know, with what? Angelman syndrome, it's a neurological disorder. So he had severe impairments. And um, I started out as an aide just to get my feet wet. I thought I was going to quit the third day. But I wasn't quitting on him because I know many people have. What happened with the kid? What was your connection with him? I, he deserved an education like everyone else did. Why were you the one to help give it to him? Because his parents allowed me to do it. They trusted in me. And the teachers that he had at the time, um, 
didn't know much about it. So I researched it as much as I can. I went into a program that really offered me on how I could really educate kids with you know, severe handicaps or disabilities. And I went to conferences. I educated myself. Sometimes we have to, we can't wait for it to come to us. Mm -hmm. I went out there, I connected, I networked. So all that networking, I was able to help that child with. And when I started seeing him progressing, I was like, wait a second, maybe I can help other kids. Why stop here? Did it change, meeting this young boy, this student, did it change your life? It did. It did. In fact, I just connected with them uh, a couple days ago, and I'm going to go see him. He's 26 years old now in Pennsylvania, and uh, he's doing really well. Hold on. Wait a minute. I'm doing the math here. My, my research, or the, our producer's research that I looked at, says he was six? He was five. He was five, because you've been doing this 20, 21 years. I'm 41. Wait a minute. Hold on. I yeah. did it very young. Hold on, are you sure that you would have gone into teaching if you hadn't met this young boy? I wouldn't have gone into teaching. I wouldn't have. Coincidence? I think so. I definitely think so. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But it's, it's very interesting on how one child can impact your life for the rest of your life. And how about you impacting his life? Um, you don't understand that impact until later on when you talk to the parents. What they and tell I think you? that's the same as it is today is that, like um, she was saying, is that, you know, you're working every single day and you always think you want to reach every learner. You don't know, you know, what light bulb you're turning on or off. And, um, and your children describe them. Anne's are different. So I work She's with, teaching with chemistry. children with autism. And sometimes you don't know the impact. They have a hard time communicating. Most of them are nonverbal. And um, the only impact you have is, is watching them demonstrating skills or at some point if they have, you know, um, develop the language skills to tell you that. If not, it comes from the parents. And it wasn't until a personal situation with my son, who uh, developed epilepsy and has speech delays, where they all just came to me. Because you know, as a special ed teacher, when it happens to you personally, you're, you're, hel you're helpless. You don't know where to go. Um, and they all said, Mark, do you remember the time you, know, you helped us understand our child's diagnosis? Remember the time you advocated for my child in the community? The time that you explained you know, the laws to us when we didn't understand them? You can do this. And they were there to support me, but you, you get so busy and tied up with trying to do the best you can for those students. Sometimes you think you can do more. Um, so it came later to un understand the impact. Just as passionate as 20, 21 years ago for Yeah, you? yep. Not retiring, right? Never. Just checking. Yep. <laughs> Roslyn, what's your story? Yes. When did you know? Um, I knew when I was, I don't know, a young, five, six years old. Come on. Yes. How? My mom had a cork board that was like half cork board, <laughs> half chalk board in our house, in our apartment. And I would Where'd line up. up? Um, I grew up in Heightstown, New Jersey. All right. Um, I would line up all my stuffed animals. She got me a record book. I took attendance. I took lunch. <laughs> no, you I didn't. taught all subjects. Yes. <laughs> you were the teacher? Yes. So I always knew. What do you think it was? Um, I think it's. L loving learning. I've always loved learning. And then being able to share that with my students who might not feel the, feel the same. So um, I think that's what it is, is, is that thirst and that yearning and that love for knowledge and then wanting to take that enthusiasm about what you, about loving learning and sharing that and infecting other, infecting my students with it. How long has it been? 13 years. How old are the kids? The students I teach, um, they're eight and nine years old. Um, how much of what you do teaching mm -hmm. eight and nine-year-old kids, how much of it is personal? Um, I would say all of it is personal because, I mean, of course, you know, I go there and I'm a, and I'm a professional, but my, the, the way in which I present things is, is going to be different than the same teacher down the hallway. Hold on. You got a curriculum to teach. Mm -hmm. You got park tests coming up. You got standardized stuff. You got to get it out there. How personal can it be? Devil's advocate. Um, I think it's very personal because they're, they're still children. They're learners. You have to take into account their families and their, their backgrounds. All that. Absolutely. How many kids? Uh, 20 this year. 20. Mm -hmm. You got to think of all that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Tiring? 
Um, no. No? No. How much passion? One to ten? Eleven. Come on! <laughs> you give me all the right answers. <laughs> Dr. Lee, come on, help us out. College is different, right? College is not different. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we got the right teachers here. Talk to us. When did you know and why, and why college? Uh, about 20 years ago, working in a research lab in Yonkers, and an ad was in the paper for this position at Essex. I went into audi um, audition. I went into <laughs> interviews or auditions. So I went in, yeah. and I was coming straight from work. Uh, I had not changed my suit or tie or anything. I'm waiting to go in between two people with suits and ties. I figure they'll like me, they won't like me. I come in, they say, can you teach anatomy and physiology? I think I can. Okay, good. I find out later that I had gotten in. I hadn't wanted to do it at first. And then one of our faculty members, Dr. Byron Johnson, called me later that night and he said to please reconsider that the students really needed me and the college needed me. And so I thought about it and talked to my wife about it and I said, this wasn't the path I was looking at going into, but okay. So I went and we talked to the president, Dr. Yamba at the Dr. time. Dr. Zach Yamba. Oh, yes. One of the greatest soccer players ever. Yes, he is. That's an obscure point. <laughs> <laughs> Zach's an old friend. Go ahead. We went into his office and he said, you want to come here and teach? And I said, yes. <laughs> you don't want to do research? I said, well, if I could do a little research here and there, that'd be great, but I think I'd like to come here and teach. Really teach? Really teach. Not do the research side so much. But just teach. teaching. Deal with students. And deal with students. Not every professor wants to do that. That is true. And over the years, I've been 23 now, it's grown. The college has grown, how the college reached out to the community has grown how it's enriched the community has grown, and the students have enriched my life. I'm, um, I think, a better person better because person. of the, better person, because of students who I interact with. And Devil's advocate, I help. before we talk about challenges. Mm. It's just work. It's just work. It enriches it your life. How does that work? It's just, it's just work. It's just your job, you say. It's a job, and it's a job that you do, but it's a job you have passion for. So when the, the times when, for example, by contract, there's certain hours you have to be there, certain things you have to do, mm -hmm. when you don't have to be there, you find yourself researching things. You find yourself, I need something for the lab to help explain a point. I'm going to go get it myself. You have students who mm -hmm. email you after five years who have gone on, they need a recommendation letter. Can you get it to me in you two days? You don't have to do it. But you do it. Why? because you love the students yeah. and you want to see them do well. All right, so let's switch gears. As much as you love it, as much as you have great passion for what you do, let's talk about some of the, even for great educators like yourselves, let's talk about some of the most pressing challenges you face. Number one challenge you feel that you and most of your colleagues face as educators today. Number one. Um, I, I think uh, I think education isn't any different than society in general. And I think society, especially in this country, we're challenged financially. We're challenged with um, jobs. Not enough people have enough jobs. We're not sure we're, in, we're educating people so that they will be employed properly in the next decades to come. I think in education at all levels, from, from a kindergarten level to a college level, and those of us that are in between, we need to always be looking at the bigger picture. We need to have the big umbrella out and make sure we're all underneath it, trying to figure out what it is our children need. And what they need in elementary school will depend on what happens in primary school. And what they need in middle school will depend on elementary school and so on. My job is to make sure that my students are prepared for their college rigors, because after college they have to get a job. And this country and its economy and actually the future of the world, mm. depends on what we do. I hope that doesn't sound too arrogant. Yeah, but you, you make, sorry for interrupting. You make it sound like your biggest challenge is getting your students ready to get a job. Ready to, to make a contribution to the future. That's right. Is that your job? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the future 
employment in this country is about to make a, a shift and a swing that is going to shake most people up. Most of the jobs, or half the jobs that exist right now aren't going to exist a decade and a half from now. Mm. And the jobs that are going to replace them, it's not to say that Americans are going to be unemployed, but it's to say that the jobs that are going to replace them are going to be in very different fields than they are now. And we better get it right. We better start the process yeah. so that our students, who will eventually be Americans, will be prepared to take these Isn't jobs. Isn't it going to be hard for you to step aside in two years? <laughs> I mean, I'm listening to you right now like you're running for office. I mean, isn't it going to be, well, Mark, isn't it be hard for her to step aside? Tell her. It will be, because in two years it's going to change, too. I mean, you're going to be on the sidelines in two years. Wow, that's harsh. And you're, you're going to be on the sidelines with all this passion. All, this, all right, this, I'll stay. How's that? See, I know I get you to do that. Yeah. Biggest challenge you face. Outside of the everyday challenges on, you know, administrators understanding what goes on in the classroom, um, I think the biggest thing is equity among all students, yeah. making sure that they have a high quality teacher, make sure they're given the same opportunities as one district from another. A parent doesn't mm -hmm. have to move from one town to another town to receive a better education. I think that's a, and I know that's a that's kind of a quite frankly policy oriented, esoteric, somewhat conversation. That I'm, I'm, I respect and appreciate what you're saying, but I could have that with a state senator. Absolutely. I'm good. asking you. But, and that's what's coming down to us. Those are topics How? we talk about as state teachers. How? Absolutely. Because they want our input. Mm -hmm. Give me an example. Break it down. Okay. When we look at, um, at the, let's say, at a local level, when you have an educator that um, you have some students that aren't doing well with one teacher, but we know another teacher can excel in that area and help that. But then the following year when they get placed in another classroom, they're not with a, an educator that can help them. So again, they may be failing for a second year. So it's us as educators to give that voice to advocate for the child, okay? And you feel your voice isn't being heard sometimes? I think so, yeah. Why do you think that is? I think it depends on, uh, I think a lot of districts are top-down approaches. I don't think there's a Top lot of- Top-down meaning? Meaning more uh, administrator driven on things. Um, Even though you guys know best. We know, I think, yeah, we definitely know best, but I also think that you have a lot of administrators in districts that aren't staying. You know, they're revolving doors. They come in. Um, I know a lot of districts that I visited as state teacher. They went through three or four principals in the last five years, mm -hmm. superintendents. Tom, when, when there's a rotation, well, I'm going to ask you a leadership question in just a couple sure. of minutes. When there's a rotating door going on, on the superintendent level, on the principal level, what impact does that have on educators in the classroom? You lose faith. You lose faith You lose confidence in, in administration. Who's really running, who's really... Jump, jump, jump in. Yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting. No, that's fine. Um, what does it mean They to you? come in and they change policy, hmm. and it's like, it's like going back to square one when you don't necessarily need to go back. For example, um, you know, you might get a new regime who comes in and says, oh, the curriculum that you currently have is no good. We're going to rewrite the whole curriculum. So then the things that, the same lessons that you taught, you know, the, the year before, you can't use because those, you know, that curriculum is no longer viable. But isn't it your curriculum with your students in your classroom? Don't you own it? Um, we have, I know where I work, we have, um, you know, clauses in our contract that state that we can, you know, we can have some control over it, but when it, when the principal is checking your lesson plans, they're going to want to see that you're you're using the current curriculum that has been approved by the board, that has been approved by <laughs> that new, yeah, but, but, you know, but, 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 regime. Of, this this is what this is the reality yeah, but, of it. But, but but you're also just saying before that there's a unique way that you right. teach, that you that's connect right. with your students, and that's your classroom. And now I hear you saying that. We gotta get, gotta have to get everything approved at this level and this level and this level, and I'm wondering where the where the the dichotomy is there. It seems like there's a contradiction. There absolutely is. So you can, even if you have to then get the curriculum the, approved, the you can do it in your own way. Yes, but you know, if it says that you're supposed to be on these certain standards and wow. so on and so forth, that's where you have to. So, that's so let's where deal with let's let's, let's 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 deal with the other elephant in the room. The standardized test issue. I, I, I think mm -hmm. it, I think as a teacher, <laughs> I, I, I recognize as a teacher, especially of a subject like chemistry and at the highest level, advanced place chemistry, which is college chemistry at the high school level, I accept the fact that it is important for not just as a state, the state of New Jersey, but all 
children in, new, in the United States of America, mm. we should be able to, in this day and age, mm. the year 2012, we should be able to agree on what is important for students to know in chemistry. Otherwise I, known as Common Core. Thank you very much. Are you okay Absolutely. with that? I am, actually. Yes, you are I am. Okay with yeah, this. I am. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with science, so as a science teacher, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not attempting to tell math and English teachers what should be in the Common Core. Mm. But I'm telling you, as an AP chemistry teacher, I'm okay with the AP chemistry curriculum that's written by a company called College Board. And, and so colleges got together and said to College Board, this is what we want our college freshmen to know in chemistry. And then College Board said to us, here you go, here's the curriculum. Now teach it, because if your children know this, then they will get credit for college chemistry. Now, a minute ago, we agreed that teaching is personal, and it is. Yes. And so once I get the curriculum and I close my classroom door, when I blow something up, that's very personal. <laughs> and it turns my curriculum into something different than just the curriculum in the college But you still have presented. to get there. I'm okay how with that. How you get there is I, how you get there. That's right. exactly right. Okay. But we have to agree that everybody's going to teach l some okay. base. L then Absolutely. let's deal with the other piece of it in New Jersey. It's more unique to New Jersey. Common Core back to New Jersey. The park test. Park test. A good thing for teachers and well, their students. Well, I think so. I teach preschool, so my kids don't have the park test. Not an issue but, for you. But I do, in our field of applied behavior analysis, it's data-driven, and we do extensive assessments. So we do formative assessments and summative assessments. In my field, we've only used data-driven instruction. So I think it will help some children as far as everything that's um, you know, uh, related to it. I, would, I, could only, I couldn't speak to there testing There are many grades. teachers we've spoken to, you know? very committed teachers who've said, that the over-reliance on park tests have taken so much time away Absolutely. from our ability to connect with our students, be creative, and have the relationship we want to and need to have with them. Because we're teaching to the test for a disproportionate amount of time that we have in school. That is the argument, you say? I agree um, that it's the, the idea of park is, is, is rich and wonderful. In theory. In theory, but you know, in the field, it's it's a mess. And so, you know, the issue is that, yes, we need to definitely always be using um, data to drive our instruction. Absolutely. I don't, there's, you, you can't. You can't not use data to drive your but. instruction. However, um, the, the commercial of Park is not the reality when you get it home. You know, you, you, you believe the commercial, you buy it, you use it, and now we can't even get the student test scores back. We don't even have teachers grading the test. It's just a ad in the newspaper and you just take the job over the summer and you make a couple dollars an hour to read over, you know, children's typing into the computer. Is it demoralizing I... <laughs> for you? Um, that's a pretty strong word. Um, it just is not, it's not what's, it's not what I need. You know, I need it, I need some, and what I need, I, I know already because I have my SGOs and I have my weekly assessments. So I know the growth that I, like, all you really needed me to do was to give you a format to track, that tracks my students' data in a way, this. right, in a way yeah, that I'm you get, could I'm look get, at. Doctor, when you hear all this, what do you think? I like the idea of, a standardized test. It's nice to know coming in what students can do. New York has had the Regents exam for mm -hmm. decades. Yes. It works well. Finding the right vehicle yeah. is the difficult part. And I think as a state, we will get there. We'll can you empathize with a lot of teachers saying, man, you're taking a lot of time away from the relationship I have with our students and the creativity that I want to create because so much time I want to have because so much time is taken teaching to the test. That is true, and that does happen. And if we get to where New York is, where the Regents material is integrated into the curriculum, you now once again are free to deliver the curriculum in whatever manner you can. And mm -hmm. when you're done, you not only have taught the course, the students are now ready for their board Are you training. finding these students that go through this testing process are better prepared to be in college? The, the one, it depends. Where I am, we have students from literally all over the world. The ones that come from what we sometimes call the British-based system, where they do a lot of writing, are great at writing. They can't fill in a multiple-choice exam. The right. ones that come from many public schools have seen multiple-choice exams for 12 years. <laughs> they can't write, and everything in between. Yeah. But when you have a standardized test and you understand 
how to approach it so people that are, say, older who have gone through careers mm -hmm. that require some sort learning of standardized how to take exam, a test. learning right. how to take a test, yeah. those are yeah. the ones that come in yeah. and uh, material independent, they're able to know what they have to do and they can do it. Why don't we do this? Uh, first of all, um, I'm going to ask you a question off the air about uh, the most important leadership lesson that uh, you've learned because teaching to me is often, I don't see how you could be a great educator without being a great leader, but I'll ask you that off the air. But I just want to say this. On behalf of all of us, all the parents out there who have uh, children in the public schools, I want to thank uh, all of you and your colleagues for everything that you do uh, on behalf of our children every day to help them grow, not just academically, but as people. Thank you very much. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, JFK Medical Center, Felician College, Qualcare Inc., Johnson & Johnson, and by the Russell Berry Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. For 17 years, the Russell Berry Foundation has recognized unsung heroes in New Jersey who have done extraordinary things for others. If you know a New Jersey resident whose selfless or heroic actions make them worthy of recognition, you can nominate them to receive the Russell Berry Making a Difference Award. With annual cash prizes of up to $50,000, this award can make a significant difference for a very deserving person. Nominations are accepted online.